Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, bringing the world's top experts right to you. Introducing your hosts, Matt Bodner and Austin Fable. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet. With more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we bring on private equity expert Perry Anderson to share the fascinating inside baseball of buying companies with no capital. This episode is more for my business listeners, but I have to say, I know Perry personally. I've actually taken his workshop and it's awesome. And I think this is a really cool conversation and I think you're going to get some fascinating insights out of it. Are you a fan of the show and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER That's S-M-A-R-T-E-R to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we brought on former Buried Life star, Ben Nempton, to discuss one of the most important questions of our lives. What do you want to do before you die? Definitely check that episode out. Now for our interview with Perry. Perry Anderson is a Canadian private equity investor, lecturer, and author. In 2002, he founded the private equity firm Quadra Capital and has completed over 30 investments across a diverse range of sectors, including Aviglion, a Canadian security surveillance company that he exited when it was sold to Motorola for $1.2 billion. Perry also lectures globally and runs a tactical M&A workshop that teaches entrepreneurs how to do deals and grow their business via mergers and acquisitions. He's also the recent author of the book, Red to Black, The Art of the Corporate Turnaround. Perry, welcome to the Science of Success. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Well, we're super excited to have you on today. And the topics that we're going to talk about in the field that you come from are topics that are near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to uh, to jump in. To start out, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got involved in the private equity world and really what your approach is today. Yeah, yeah. I guess my background, so I'm... um... Canadian by nationality, so but I sort of identify as a bit of a global citizen. So I sort of split time between homes in in Vancouver, BC, and London, England. And um, yeah, I started a, a private equity firm, kind of in the loosest sense of the word, in back in 2002 called Quadra Capital. We're a relatively small boutique, and we sort of we focus on sort of the lower end of the the M and A market. So companies that are typically doing sub. 20 million in turnover, not focused on kind of the bleeding edge tech companies, but sort of all of the companies that are sort of established and have long sort of track records of profitability. And so small team at Quadra, so headquartered out of, uh, out of Vancouver, have a, an office here in, in London, which is where I'm at uh, today. And we sort of, yeah, we've got a footprint in kind of the US, UK and Canada. So 11 of us on the team. Everybody comes from fairly blue chip backgrounds. Everybody sort of has worked from sort of the likes of Goldman Sachs, the Rothschild, PwC, Carlyle Group, etc. We don't see ourselves as sort of stodgy bankers. We're um, we're sort of entrepreneurs and deal makers that are out sort of looking to um, do deals and hopefully craft uh, meaningful exits. So that's sort of what we do sort of 90% of the time. And uh, probably the other 10% of my time is I also sort of lecture globally on the topic of SME M&A. So people that are out sort of looking to go out and potentially do their own deals and go out and acquire a you know small to medium sized enterprise and uh, typically without having to go out and use a lot of your own capital in order to transact. So I guess in my own journey, I've I've sort of made a lot of mistakes and going, you know, walking into banks and having to, you know, personal guarantee things and, you know, put up your house as collateral and give, you know, pints of blood and give the kids away and all these good things. But I, I've kind of come to realize that there's you know, hopefully smarter ways to, to transact. And so we've got fairly good inroads into the, the capital markets and sort of spent a career sort of raising money through the, the capital markets. And, and so we've, uh, I guess we've completed about uh, over 30 deals in the past, I guess, since, since 2002 and bought and sold several businesses. And we've taken three companies public and and again, kind of raised quite a bit of capital through the, the private and alternative finance markets. And so we, you know, we're fairly comfortable in that space and it kind of underpins what we're doing. And so I do this and sort of eat my own cooking on a full-time basis, but again, sort of, you know, happy to sort of share knowledge to people that are looking to do deals for themselves as well. That's so interesting. And, and I want to break down and get it 
you know, sort of specific on some of these things. So broadly speaking, you said under 20 million in revenues, the target that you guys look at, do you have rough EBITDA metrics that you like to focus on? And are there industry verticals that you typically play more in? Obviously you said maybe cutting edge kind of high tech stuff is not necessarily of interest, but are there sort of industry segments that you find most interesting? Yeah, so we're sector agnostic. Aside from we're not looking at kind of bleeding edge companies who you know figure that you know they're not making any money per se or they're they're hemorrhaging cash, but yet they're of course they're going to sell to Google for a gazillion dollars. So we're not looking at uh, businesses like that. We're looking at basically anything else, anything else with a sort of a stable balance sheet and sort of a history of profitability and low debt levels, size wise. Again, sort of sub twenty million. That's pretty much by design because larger private equity they don't want to look at small deals. They just can't make the economics work of going into that space. And for sort of a a micro investor or a small business purchaser, they usually tend to look at stuff that they can sort of rationalize and that they can figure that they can do in line with what they understand. So if somebody has $100,000 of you know, cash in their jeans, they're probably going to buy something that's in line with what they've got. They're going to buy a hundred dollars or $200,000 business. And so there's a real gap between sort of the small business buyer and large private equity. And so we, we sort of play in that space where there is not a lot of legitimate business buyers in that, you know, in that market. And so we're kind of living in a really interesting times right now. So I guess on one side of the ledger, we've got all the baby boomers that are now retiring. And so it's the largest macroeconomic shift that's been going on sort of in the, the history of the world. And so it's really interesting. We've got people that it's not a, a want to retire, it's a need. And so they're either, you know, they're either looking, they need to get out from they're just getting old, they're sick, they're tired, they're dying, they're getting divorced, whatever the life circumstance, but they need to get rid of this business. The kids typically don't want these businesses. The kids want to go out and do the startup that's going to hopefully sell to Google for a gazillion dollars. And so, you know, kids don't today don't want to run mom and dad's widget manufacturer, but there's more and more of these coming to market all of the time. And so that's on one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger is there's a disproportionate amount of capital that's actually available for acquisitions. And so going out and doing a startup, everybody's out, everybody and their dog is out trying to sort of go do the startup right now. And those are very difficult to, to capitalize and the failure rates are off the charts. Michael Gerber, who wrote The E-Myth, which is a really interesting book, he mentions about you know, circa 94% of, our, uh, of all sort of startup businesses actually fail within the first five years. That's very dramatic. And so I think there's a smarter way to be able to go out. And so we're living in really interesting times because there's, there's a lot of capital that's available. Again, hard to capitalize a, a startup, but there's a lot of cash that's available for you know, businesses that have long operating histories and decent balance sheets, and they've got their cash flow positive and relatively low debt levels. And so those are relatively easy to do. And so lots of capital available for them. So you know, sort of playing in between both of those market dynamics is kind of an interesting place to be at the moment. So. Yeah, there's just some really positive macro tailwinds supporting kind of lower middle market M&A right now. And, and as you touched on, a really interesting component of a lot of these deals, which I don't know if you're familiar with Walker Diebel or his book, Buy Then Build, also kind of talks about the same idea of it's actually much less risky to just buy a company that already has revenue, customers, profits, track record, assets that you can leverage, as opposed to doing a startup. And yet 95% of people gravitate more towards the startup side of the puzzle and there's a tremendous and growing number of businesses that are being forced under the market by baby boomers that are currently selling. So very interesting dynamics out there right now. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It is a great time to be able to do this. And again, sort of a lot of capital that's available for this. So I've got a good friend of mine who, who actually is US-based. He, he runs a fund and, and their fund is, you know, they will put up sort of upwards, just to give one, one example, you know, they'll put up up to 100% of the capital required to go out and you know, for somebody to buy a business. And there's a lot of these shops that are just sitting on, on way too much capital at the moment. And you know, from somebody on one side of the fence is, where am I going to get the money to do this? People on the other side of the fence, sort of in the capital markets, they're saying, look, we're sitting on a ton of cash. And this last year sort of has obviously been a bit of a black swan event with COVID and all the ramifications from that. But it, you know, it's been somewhat problematic for these companies, uh, the finance firms, to be able to deploy all this capital. And so there's a lot of pent up demand and they're really looking for, you know, for smart homes to, you know, to deploy this capital into. So yeah, timing is great to be in this space. So I'm very curious about your perspective on valuations right now in terms of, especially in the lower middle market, I guess one, where do you guys typically like to transact? And I'm sure it varies by industry segment a lot, but just 
sort of rough metrics? Where are you trying to kind of land from an EBITDA multiple standpoint? And then what are you seeing from a valuation standpoint of deals that get funded by institutional capital or, or you know institutional LPs or whatever? Where do you typically see them being comfortable with the valuation versus being uncomfortable? Yeah. So in terms of them being comfortable or uncomfortable, I think it's really, it's more in terms of how do you de-risk the transaction? So, you know, we're de-risking that, but these are not new businesses. These are very well established businesses. Again, as I mentioned before, long, uh, you know, long history and long track records of profitability. So we're de-risking it from, you know, nobody's going to give a seller sort of a, a bag of cash on closing and let them sort of walk off into the, into the sunset. So, you know, we're typically raising sort of a typical deal structure for us is, you know, we're putting down circa 50% cash down on closing. And then, you know, the balance is going to be some form of uh, deferred consideration or earn out on the back end, to sort of round off the transaction. And, and again, to kind of de-risk the proposition. And so funders like to see that. They like to go into something that's de-risked where, you know, the, the seller is, is going to be taking some risk through this, through the deal. And so it's a multi-year deferred or multi-year sort of earn out. And so they tend to get comfortable that they know that, hey, look, even if the seller is you know, going to be sort of sitting on the proverbial beach next week, I mean, he's going to be tied in and handcuffed from, you know, from a standpoint that he's got to take some payments over time. So that's what we're kind of seeing in the capital market side of things. And so from a valuation or a, a, an EBITDA multiple perspective, I would say by and large, sort of the sub 20 million you know, non bleeding edge tech company, they're kind of trading for between sort of three to four X EBITDA, something like that. Obviously, it sort of levers down if it's a low barrier to entry business that doesn't have the clients on contractual recurring revenues, et cetera, et cetera. And then vice versa, if, you know, if they have their all their clients on, you know, contractual recurring revenue and they've got, you know, it's a very high barrier to entry business and et cetera, et cetera, you know, the multiple sort of scale up. But I would say most of our offers are going out the door sort of circa three, three and a half X EBITDA. And we've closed four deals this year. And we actually bought a film production company recently. And that was, uh, you know, that ended up sort of completing it to about three times cash flow. And so that seems to be sort of the give or take, the rough metric for these sort of, again, non bleeding edge tech companies and sort of the lower MA market. Very interesting. On the deferred compensation piece of the puzzle, do you have a, I mean, I'm sure it varies by a specific transaction, but do you have a, a preference or do you see funders typically having a preference for stuff that skews more towards hard traditional seller financing versus earnouts? Do you think that they're roughly, I mean, they're very similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. How do you think about which of those is more optimal and why would you choose one versus the other in a, in a particular transaction? So it's interesting. You know, I, I guess the one thing that I've sort of learned in, I guess, in sort of the deal making process is, you know, some people, they've got a lot of P firms or a lot of investment sort of shops. I mean, they've got the, the process of, you know, they try to shove a deal down someone's throat and they say, look, here it is. Here's how we transact, take it or leave it. And so we've adopted a slightly different, you know, more com- collaborative sort of process in that, you know, we're not out trying to shove a deal down somebody's throat. We're out we're trying to find the why and what's driving the seller to actually be exiting out of the business that they're sort of looking to get out of. And, and everybody has, you know, th- their perspectives are very different. I mean, we've worked on deals from, you know, a gentleman who's actually in a hospice dying and he's obviously trying to get his, his estate in order. So, I mean, that's his driver. We've dealt with people that are getting divorced. We've got people that are just burnt out and just completely tired. They've got second, third businesses. This one's just a thorn in their side. They just don't want this anymore. So that driver are, are all slightly different. And so what we would do in our process is we'd rather try to tailor something around what they're actually looking for, as opposed to sort of, again, ramming it down their throat. And we find that that's a much better way to approach a transaction because you know, look, if you're dealing with large sort of corporate M&A, you've got a board talking to a board. There's not a lot of emotion that's sort of tied into these deals. Two boards will make a decision, how much for the horse, you know, they they hammer it out and kind of deal gets done. But, you know, the sub 20 million space, the SME business is the complete inverse of that. So these are businesses where, you know, it's a lot of times it's a family run business. There's a succession plan that needs to be happened. You know, this is almost like a child that they've raised in their family for, you know, X amount of years. And so they want to make sure that, you know, yes, obviously 
price is is something and you know the value that's going to be attached to that. I, I mean, of course, that's important. But the soft things that I've actually found that are actually really interesting, and I've sort of been speaking to business owners for you know almost the last two decades, and it's been really interesting. I've been sort of keeping tabs on, and I tend to ask sellers like, what's important to you in the deal? And I always thought sort of growing up that it can't be anything aside from the money component. I was actually dead wrong. And, and money is actually, it actually ranks sort of number three in the, the hierarchical food chain. And so number one, the most important thing when somebody's selling a business is that their brand and their legacy is going to continue. So they don't typically want to go out and sell to a competitor who's just going to take the sign down and sort of fold them into a, a division. They're proud of what they've created. They want the legacy to continue. So they're really looking for a, a safe pair of hands that's going to be able to sort of, you know, navigate them to the next stage of the business's growth. So that was actually the most important thing that they're looking for. The second thing is they want to make sure that their staff is going to be safe. That's interesting as well, because if you sell to big private equity, which a lot of businesses do, what does private equity do best? Well, they come in and they swing the ax on, on sort of day two and they call it optimization, but they immediately go and just sort of lay off a bunch of people immediately. And so understand they, they have to do that, but this is not what a small to medium sized business owner wants. They want to make sure, you know, the staff is like their family or in a lot of cases it is their family and they don't want to see somebody just uh, coming in and, and swinging the ax. So those two elements need to be addressed in these the sort of the SME deal space. It's not just the money. Yes, money is, is sort of the third thing that's important. But again, sort of brand, integrity, legacy, and staff are all things that sort of come ahead of it. So we sort of try to wrap a deal structure that's going to be able to address all of those things. And I think the paradigm shift for me happened was I used to go out and sort of try to hammer a deal down and say, look, this is kind of, you know, how we see it, sort of more of a take it or leave it type attitude. But I think the, um, you know, as I've sort of, I guess, matured into what I'm doing, I mean, we're, we sort of have the, the opposite approach is that we really just want to see what's important to somebody and we want to build a structure, sort of a win-win structure around our deal. And I think if we can do that, if we can de-risk it, if we can get the seller what they want, we should find a way to, for ourselves to be able to take care of it ourselves. And yeah, usually a funder is typically happy with that as long as the transaction is going to be de-risked. That's a great insight. And the perspective of positioning yourself away from the PE firms or strategics that are going to be either slash and burning the staff or, you know, subsuming the brand and rolling it in. It's a great perspective, a really good way to make yourself more attractive to a potential seller. From digging down on the capital partner side a little bit more, where do you typically see capital partners landing? You touched on the idea of maybe 50% of the, the consideration being deferred. Where do you typically see them landing in terms of, or do you see much of a preference between seller financing earnouts around that piece? I would say there's not one size fits all. You know, we got pretty good access into the sort of the North American and UK capital markets. People look at this from a different perspective. I think as long as the deal is de-risked, so there's going to be some form of deferred, some form of burnout, perhaps it's a blend, perhaps it's one or the other. Funders and financiers are typically not completely fussed about how much of each is, is going to be weighed. As long as the overall deal makes sense, as long as you're paying a fair price as long as the debt can be serviced. And again, as long as they can see this transaction being um, de-risked from their standpoint, then it's, uh, yeah, however it sort of slices and dices is fine. That makes a lot of sense. How do you think about, or what's your approach at Quadra to your capitalization structure? Are you a funded PE shop? Are you more of an independent sponsor? Do you have a hybrid model? How do you think about your broader capitalization? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question. So. Um, We've given a lot of thought, so we're not a fund, and that has actually turned out to be by design. So I started my career as, as an entrepreneur and I've actually got a, a slightly different career journey. I've actually never had a job before. I've gone right into entrepreneurship at a, at a very young age and sort of uh, promised my mother that if, you know, let me start with one at a young age and if it completely fails, I promise to go back and get a job. And fortunately, I haven't had to do that. I just sort of kept rolling, but I was in the back of my mind, I always... I think I'm going to have to go back to my mother one day, but fortunately, I haven't had to do that. <laughs> but yeah, so we've given a lot of thought about this actually internally. So we are not a fund actually. And so this has been by design because when I started out my career doing deals, I was sort of cobbling together some of my own capital and going out and trying to find either an investor or bank debt to be able to close on it and, and kind of you know doing it that way. And I made a lot of mistakes going down that path and using sort of conventional bank financing and and all this. And so we've we sort of evolved. We, we had some conversations probably almost a decade ago 
talking about, do we want to go down the path of becoming a fund? And we actually sort of ruled against it because being a fund, it comes with a lot of obligation. And so you've got to obviously be able to to receive capital. You've got to be able to deploy capital. You've got to be able to exit your investment, repatriate the capital. So there's a lot of moving parts to that. And there's a lot of demand on having to get a deal bought or sold. And that's tough. I mean, especially moving into you know uncertain markets, if you've got you know, three, four, five-year time horizons, things obviously change. And so I'm fairly lifestyle driven and I sort of try to, I don't want all that pressure to be able to do that. I don't want to have to do a deal or not have to do a deal. So we've sort of gone against going out to become an actual fund. And so we are fundless sponsor. However, you know, we've, we've got, you know, sort of decade plus relationships with sort of key funders in, again, kind of the UK, US and Canada that we sort of go to for, you know, for capital, for various deals. And so we're not really in a position that we have to do a deal which is actually, I think, is an enviable place to be. And so we don't have to do anything. And so we just sort of do things as they come up and however they make sense and however, whatever feels right, however we can carve out a win-win scenario is kind of the way that we kind of view view business. So how has your approach changed away from traditional bank debt and personal capital to, I mean, we touched on some of the deal structure components earlier, but where are you sourcing funds from typically and what do those funds look like? I.e., are you pulling from family offices? Are you pulling from SBIC lenders? Are you pulling from still some traditional banks, you know, non-traditional lenders, debt funds? And then is that typically more in the form of equity, MES, senior financing, et cetera? Yeah. So we, um, we basically veered away completely from sort of the conventional bank. I mean, you know, a conventional bank, they've got zero entrepreneurship to them. I mean, they're all about, you know, give us three times the collateral and, you know, maybe we'll give you back sort of, you know, one time, you know, in terms of a loan. And so not in the business of sort of putting up all these, you know, my house or children to be able to pledge as, as collateral. And so, so yeah, we've completely veered away of that. So we're typically, yeah, we do use a lot of uh, family offices. We've got a lot of contacts. We've also got sort of kind of senior senior slash mez groups that like to participate so they'll put in sort of you know more aggressively price sort of fixed price debt if you will to be able to sort of close off these transactions and again usually our structure is we're typically putting in sort of 30 50 percent cash down by way of you know fixed coupon debt and then the rest is going to be carried as again kind of deferred or you know and or no and so that's kind of rounds off the transaction and so that's been quite interesting as well from a personal standpoint, because I sort of didn't realize that it was possible that you could go out and do deals without using any of your own capital. And and probably the first half a dozen of deals that I've done kind of growing up as a as, as a youngster trying to figure this out, I didn't really have a mentor per se. And so I was sort of, you know, going through all of the setbacks and the failures and the struggles of kind of having to piece this all together myself. And I didn't think that there was another way to do it except for going to the conventional bank. But what I've actually come to realize is that there's a much larger secondary market of capital that would take a sort of an aggressive approach. And as long as a company's got, you know, sufficient cash flow and, and, and a decent balance sheet, they would certainly be willing to advance against that to be able to complete a deal. And so the spotlight, if you will, tends to come off of yourself. So when you go to a, a conventional bank, it's all about you and what's your credit score and how much money you have in your bank and, you know, prove yourself to us. But when you're actually going out to the alternative finance markets, the spotlight comes off yourself and it's, it's much more geared towards the asset that you're looking to acquire. And so they're, they're more concerned about, again, the cash flow that that produces and, and what does the balance sheet look like? And, and so, yeah, a lot of these deals can be structured. So we're typically not even using any of our own capital to be able to go out and, and transact. So that's been a little bit of an epiphany on my journey because I, I didn't realize that you could, you know, not not go to the bank to fund a transaction. And there's a whole other world out there kind of behind the closed door that, you know, it's a big space and there's a lot of capital that will, will take a view on a lot of deals like this. How do you answer, or maybe you don't even encounter this because you have some legacy relationships that have proven this out, but how do you typically deal with the sort of skin in the game argument of, hey, you need to have X amount of this deal to show that you're vested in it and that you're not just going to walk away from the loan? Yeah. So, I mean, part of it is legacy relationships, but the other part is obviously locking the seller in to a deal as well. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, the last thing that 
we want or a financier wants is, you know, is giving somebody a bag of cash and, and they're sort of, you know, walking right out the door with it onto the, onto the beach. And so we're making sure that the deals that we're doing where the seller is actually going to be locked in to the process. So it's either they're going to be locked in or there's going to have a layer of management beneath them that's going to be locked in to ensure that the transition is going to happen smoothly. And so as long as they know that, you know, there's incentivization on behalf of the seller to remain with the business and to make sure that they're going to be on a contract to be able to stay with the business for you know an X amount of time. And as long as they're going to be locked in, funders will take a view on that. So asking the question a different way, do the non-traditional alternative lenders and capital partners that you're typically working with, they're okay with very equity light deals and they don't say, hey, mm-hmm. you know, we're willing to put up, even if it's even if they're only at a say a 50 or 35% or whatever LTV, they say, hey, we'll essentially treat the deferred compensation as your as equity contribution. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah, correct. That's awesome. Correct. Yeah. It's a game changer because and, and I guess that's how I, I sort of Another epiphany I had was, I guess, several years ago, I ended up buying a chain of retail stores. It was a small deal, but it was, uh, they're doing it's about just under 2 million a year and they're profitable. The guy was sort of, you know, netting out about 10% and it just kind of something that fell onto my lap. And so I ended up doing a deal where I bought the whole company out sort of lock, stock and barrel and I did it for, I bought it for a dollar. And so that was, that was a bit of a, of an interesting situation as well. And the way that the deal was structured made a lot of sense for the seller to do. And so completed several deals like this. And somebody once asked me, they said, look, is it, is it possible to go out and buy a business without using any of your own capital? And I said, yeah, sure. I said, I've done it several times. And so they said, well, how do you do it? And I was kind of explaining this to somebody and, and they said, well, that's really interesting. And they're like, how do you, you know, you really need to tell somebody about this. And so a bit of a light bulb moment went on. And so that's sort of why I started doing these little uh, workshops on the side to kind of show people how to go out and, you know, go source deals and how to structure them properly and de-risk them and then how to raise all the capital to close and then, and then sort of, you know, how to negotiate and a whole bunch of things and, and a few sort of wealth hacks and tips and tricks that I've learned over the past kind of uh, two decades of doing this on the, on the back end. And so, yeah, but sort of several hundred people through the program and it's been interesting. Some of them uh, had a, a young fellow who's actually from Edmonton, Canada, that he went out last year and he was debating about going out to um, go to school and you know go get a, a conventional job. And so he kind of went through the program and I kind of end up losing touch with some of these people that end up coming and you don't know who sort of takes this material and who does well with it. But he actually came back to me and kind of rang me up. He says, you know, Perry, love to love to chat. And I said, sure, what's what's going on? And he says, listen, he goes, I bought two businesses last year. I'm using any of my own capital, doing exactly, you know what you, you kind of laid out in your workshop. And so he's kind of off to the races. And for me, this was, this was absolutely brilliant. So he's out doing it himself. And yeah, he's close to already. And he's kind of working on the third now. And so, so yeah, I kind of give people a bunch of different frameworks, how to be able to go out and uh, do deals without typically using your own capital. So Very interesting. And for someone who doesn't have some of the capital relationships, obviously you've developed over the last 20 years of being in private equity, how do you feel about resources like capital brokers, placement agents, et cetera, to help you source that capital? Or how would you recommend approaching finding those capital partners? Yeah, you know, I think the quote unquote broker in, in all aspects is pretty difficult. So I, I would, I don't try to rely on business brokers in terms of sourcing and on the capital side, I don't typically rely on brokers either. So actually through the workshop, I, I end up giving everybody sort of, a, we've got a pretty robust list of funders in US, UK and Canada that, you know, will step in and fund these deals if they're, if they're structured sort of properly and obviously tick the uh, tick the criteria that we're looking for. So I show people on the program how to actually structure these according to what the funders want and then actually give them the funders and their you know, direct contact details and everything so they can kind of go out and present them with a, a deal and these funders will will fund if it's structured properly and the deal sort of makes sense. So, but yeah, I think outsourcing that stuff is hard. I think from a, a deal sourcing perspective, you're much better off to source deals yourself. And from a, a financing standpoint, it's like anything you like. I mean, you got to build relationships and I think you're much better off to tell the story as opposed to a third party trying to tell the story on your behalf. Let's dig into the deal flow side of that a little bit more. You mentioned some very interesting stories earlier, whether it's people going through a divorce and hospice care, et cetera. How are you sourcing opportunities like that? And how do you think about, you touched on not really being a huge fan of business brokers. How do you think about generating deal flow, especially if you're starting from essentially being flat-footed or not having some of the legacy relationships that someone like you might have? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so I've just been at this for a long time. So we don't, my answer is not the right one because we don't do a lot of sourcing. We have people kind of feeding us stuff sort of all the time, just because I've just been in the space for, for quite a while. But I think somebody that's starting out, I think we get a lot of sort of tactical strategies on actually going out to source deals. But I think probably the best one that I could recommend is really looking into your own contact list and your own cell phone and who inside there, you know, do you have a relationship with? And if you sort of, because just by virtue of this macroeconomic shift that's going on in the world right now, everybody's uncle right now is looking to sell or get out of their business. And so if you sort of tap into your own network of people that you know and say, hey, I'm looking to buy a business. Can you actually introduce me to somebody? Well, you know, chances are somebody in your, you know, your 20 closest contacts or your friends or whomever is going to be able to introduce you to somebody that's selling a business right now. And so the beauty of that is you're actually getting introduced as a credible individual. You know, come talk to my uncle. Like, I want you to meet Matt. Matt's a great guy. You know, definitely he's interested in buying a business just like yours. So when you, Matt, walk in, you've already come introduced. You're not a complete stranger to them. And so this is all about an exercise in rapport building. And so you, you've gone out and you're coming there validated. And so you're meeting somebody, you can, you can start having a bit more meaningful of a conversation. And it's not about positioning yourself as, you know, we're, you know, the private equity firm that's, you know, looking to do a, a lopsided deal with you and offer you 10 cents on the, on the dollar. No, this is all about approaching them from a, a very collaborative standpoint like understand you need to get out of this thing and you're a safe pair of hands matt and how can we figure out a way you know to make both sides of the equation work and so this is all very relationship driven and the best deals work as a function of the quality of the relationship that you're able to build and just looking back in my career i mean there's a direct correlation with the the businesses that i've been able to do deals with are the ones where i've spent a lot of time and, and I've built great rapport with these people. And the ones where I haven't built as great rapport and I haven't spent as much time, I haven't been able to get them over the line. And there's a, there's a real correlation attached to this. And again, just as a function of the, the space that we're in, we're sort of looking at the small to medium sized enterprise. And those are very sort of unlike the large sort of corporate M&A transaction. You know, these smaller deals, they're very relationship driven. So I think going back to the you know, question about sourcing, how do you source these or how do you find them? You know, there's lots of things you can do, but I think the best one is to tap into your own network, you know, contact your 10 or 15 closest contacts and say, look, who do you know that's selling a business right now? Can you introduce me to them? And, you know, chances are then they will know somebody and chances are, you know, hopefully you've been a, a good friend and they're going to introduce you uh, as a person of substance and credibility and a safe pair of hands and, and, you know, start these conversations, start having these conversations with, with sellers because, You'd be surprised once you actually get into conversations with these sellers, what they actually want and what they're looking for actually changes. If you go to a business broker, you're going to get one side of the story and you're going to get a narrative that's been produced by a broker. And a lot of times it's based on very unrealistic expectations. The broker is going to say, oh, we've got, you know, come sign up with us. We've got sellers that are going to pay you a gazillion dollars for your business and they're going to give you all cash on closing. And then if, if you go down that path and, you know, you sort of, you bite the hook, I guess, and you know, you're know you dealing with a brokered business, a lot of times the expectations are out of line. And so you know, if you say, look, we're going to pay you circa three times cash flow for your business, they're going, to, you know, they're going to be like, well, no, the broker told us you're going to give us you know, 10 times cash flow for our business. And so it just sets the tone off on the wrong foot. And so I think you're much better off to be able to go out and just establish relationships with your own network. And you know, right now, we're just living in a time where Again, large macroeconomic shift of, of people looking, not even looking, they need to sell their business. The baby boomers, they need to find an exit. And so it's a great time to be doing this. How do you think about things like intermediaries, whether they're lawyers, CPAs, accounting firms, et cetera? Do you think that that, do you typically source opportunities from folks like that? Or do you find that to be not a, a really valuable source of deal flow? Yeah, I think anyone who's not sort of too financially benefited from making that introduction is probably a good source. So unlike a broker, yeah, you know, I think if you know the lawyer, I think, you know, great lawyers got a lot of clients, they could always find you somebody that's looking to sell. I think accountants are great. Accountants obviously have a big book of business, they can tell you who's getting ready for retirement. If you're approaching an accountant, the one thing I would probably say to them is I would say, look, I'm looking to buy a business. Is there some way that you could introduce me to a seller? And keep in mind, Mr. and Mrs. Accountant, that 
you know, we want to continue to retain, you know, your accounting services if we're successful at making a transaction happen. And that's sort of, you know, I guess the biggest fear as an accountant is that, you know, you're going to buy the business and their, their sort of clockwork revenue stream is going to stop if you bring their accounting elsewhere. So, but if you sort of are up front and just say, listen, we want to, if you can make an introduction, we're absolutely going to retain you and, and, and keep you engaged as the accountant on this deal. As long as they know that they've got, you know, you're not cutting off their reoccurring revenue stream, then, you know, they should be typically happy to, to make some introductions. So yeah, I think, you know, accountants and lawyers are, are a better place than brokers. Changing gears a little bit, how do you think about management at a lot of these businesses, especially in lower middle market SMB space? You have very disparate management pictures. In a lot of cases, it's one person holding the whole show together. Some instances, the sellers actually built somewhat of a management team. What's your approach to solving the management piece of the puzzle? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, if you're a large private equity firm, you're going to do a transaction, you're going to be handcuffing the sellers to the desk. I mean, they are, you know, PE shops are usually kind of the, the smartest guys in the room, especially when it comes to these deals. And they're, they know that, you know, there'll probably be some component of cash and, you know, some jam tomorrow that, you know, if you hit, you know, such a hurdle, you know, you're going to get, you know, more cash as you go. They know exactly how high to hit the bar. And a lot of times the, the seller sort of never gets that. But what they're going to do is they're going to absolutely handcuff the seller to the desk. They're not going to let them get away. And so that really defeats the purpose kind of in the small to medium size world of a seller that's actually looking to get out of the business. You know, handcuffing a seven-year-old person to the desk is not sort of a great way to do this. And again, this comes back to the soft things, like they sort of need to get out of the business. And so the way that we sort of take a view on this is we're here to listen as to what's the real driver of the business. Some of them say, look, we're happy to stay on for another one, two, three years. And so great if they want to do that. If they don't want to do that and they want to sort of, you know, kind of be on the proverbial beach, that's fine too. However, you know, the way that the handcuffs are going to work, they're not going to be a short pair of handcuffs, they're going to be a long pair of handcuffs. And so, yes, they can sort of sit on the proverbial beach, but they're going to be carrying a fair bit of the, the seller financing of that deal. And so that's how we're sort of hooking them in that, you know, if something starts to go sideways in the business and we, we phone them for a bit of advice or experience or what we need to, to kind of get from them, they're going to take our call because they want to make sure that they're going to get the next payment. And so I think the way that, that we would typically take a view on this is sort of the, the more that they completely want out of the business immediately, you know, I think the, the third consideration or the earn out is going to have to be slightly longer as opposed to somebody that says, you know, look, we just want to crystallize and exit, know what that looks like. We don't have to be out today, but we're happy to, to kind of phase out over the next kind of, you know, one, two, three years. So that's fine. I mean, we have, you know, as long as they're going to be there, we, we got to make sure that the business is going to be able to operate. And then the other thing is as well is kind of the layer of management below them is going to be really important. So typically the, you know, a couple of ways to be able to kind of do that, you know, one, some people go out and source kind of CEOs or whomever to run the business, to bring them in from the outside. Yeah, I can do that. We've got kind of relationships with headhunters and such, but that's typically not what happens. Usually what happens is we get to know somebody and because it's all relationship driven and then it sort of happens to be, okay, well, you know, who's the next sort of, uh, key person in this business. And they say, oh, well, you know, Bob's been here for 24 years and he knows everything about the business. And he's our key guy. And well, guess what? Bob just got a promotion. And so, you know, Bob's going to be now the man. He's going to get the corner office and he's going to have the, you know, the authority to, to sort of make some decision making. So it's easy for the seller to sort of phase out as long as we've got Bob in there and we're going to, we would sort of tie Bob in with sort of potentially an equity package and giving him sort of, you know, some ownership in the business. So you have an alignment of interest. So we're sort of happy to do that. And, you know, Bob's going to be happy because he gets a pay raise and he gets a corner office and, you know, he might have some incentive to be a part of, of the business. And so that usually kind of mitigates the risk in the seller leaving. And the side fringe benefit from that is if Bob sort of knows that there's a deal happening on the periphery and, Bob may be able to get a piece of equity in the business or some ownership. You want him to know that because he's obviously going to lobby for the deal on your behalf because Bob wants that corner office, Bob wants that equity. So if you sort of you build up some rapport with Bob as well, getting to know him, he's going to lobby for you to the seller because they, you know he, he wants to make sure that he can reap the rewards of his 24 years of service that's been at the business. And so, yeah, he's going to help sell the business for you as well. And it makes you look like 
rock star getting into the business because you know you're paying a fair price for the business and you know you're getting you're letting the seller get out without sort of being handcuffed to the desk you're also taking care of the staff and so you know not only are you not firing Bob, you're empowering Bob, you're giving Bob ownership and, and, you know, there's going to be continuity of the business because, you know, Bob's been there for a long time and, you know, Bob knows the business probably just as well, if not better than the owner himself. So, Is there a disqualifying framework where you think about that if there's just not a certain amount of Bob's or level of management in the business that you just pass on the opportunity? Or how do you think about things that have a thin management team? Yeah, so I guess we wouldn't be looking at companies that are probably micro deals. And when I say micro, I'm sort of kind of the, it typically under kind of a million would probably be no, because the smaller the business like that, the more risk there is and the lighter the management. It's typically a, a single owner operator. They're not going to have that depth and breadth of sort of a layer of management beneath them. So we're, we're typically looking at companies as a minimum that are kind of doing a couple million of kind of turnover and I'd say probably two to 10 million of, of kind of revenue is, is sort of our sweet spot because to your point, I mean, they have some at that level of, of business, although these are relatively small businesses at that level, they're going to have some infrastructure below them that, you know, if Bob needs to sort of get out of the business, there's going to be people there that can step in to run the business. Tell me a little bit more. You touched briefly on headhunters. How do you think about that as a, an arrow in your quiver is it a last resort? Is it a helpful approach when you need management help? Do you find that to be something useful? Yeah, I mean, it definitely could be, but I would say by and large, most of these deals are, there's going to be continuity from the existing staff to take over because I'd much rather have somebody that's been in the business for 10, 15, 20 years. They've been there. I'd rather have that as the person that's now taking up the corner office as opposed to the, you know, the MBA, CFA, CFO, you know, lots of designations to come into the business. Yeah, he's qualified, but I mean, he doesn't know the business as well as sort of, you know, the incumbents. And so I think that um, I would say the headhunting is sort of probably the path of last resort. We'd much rather elevate somebody from the existing staff. How do you think about broken deal costs and diligence expenses, especially as more independent sponsors skew, I guess with your model, maybe the diligence requirements may be lighter, but how do you typically think about managing those expenses, especially for somebody who's, who's just getting into this game? Yeah. So great question. So actually I've been burnt a bunch of times on, you know, when I was kind of starting out on, on deals that didn't complete. And so I was sort of, I was kind of writing my own checks for, you know, lawyers and accountants and, you know, trying to get a deal over the line. And yeah, you know, I, you risk your time and if you can't complete that, you know, that's unfortunate. But I think what really is unfortunate is two weeks later when you get a legal and an accounting bill in the mail, uh, a couple of weeks later, you know, for paying for a deal that didn't complete. And so that's not a lot of fun. So out of sort of sheer necessity, I guess, if you will, I, I sort of, develop something that I, I kind of share with people in my program about how to ensure that you're not going to be stuck out of pocket, having to pay sort of lawyers and accountants on deals that don't complete. And obviously, if the deal completes, it's the company that picks up those costs. But yeah, I, I do have some actual strategy around that that I sort of share with people in the in the workshop. And I give them sort of a, a specialized, small little agreement that I, I get people to sign up to for that. But yeah, kind of, you know, I, I think, look, as, as entrepreneurs, we're you know, we're, we're risk takers. We're, we're people that are investing our time for, you know, hopefully a, an outcome that makes sense on, on the back end. And so, you know, we're risking our time, but I, I'm really of the opinion that there's a lot of ways to sort of, you know, de-risk the, the actual hard checks that's attached to it. And I think as my career sort of evolved, it was, you know, I was the guy that was putting sort of my equity on the line and my personal guarantee and, you know, pledging my home on the line and doing all these things and kind of paying the, the legal and accounting bills on deals that didn't close. And, and that was not a lot of fun. And so I, I've sort of evolved from necessarily having to use your, any of your own capital to do these deals. And it's it just been, it's been kind of interesting because I think the farther I, I've gone in my career, the less actual hard equity that we've been having to use. And so it's been a bit of an epiphany. And I think that a lot of people aren't, maybe just aren't 
you know, it's conventional wisdom, I guess, that you, you know, if you need money, you go to the bank. But I guess, you know, banks are kind of the, the worst places to go if you need capital. And, you know, there are other alternatives and there's ways to sort of de-risk a lot of the stuff. And there's a lot of frameworks that can be done. So you're not going to be uh, having to use a lot of your own capital or, or very little to be able to get a deal done. And certainly, you know, when it comes to fees and diligence costs and all that, we definitely have some strategies on the back end to try to mitigate that as well. So, Would you say... Broadly speaking, those approaches are primarily in more in the bucket of risk sharing with the service providers, i.e., hey, I'll, I'll catch up on the next deal. Or would you say they're more broadly just reducing the overall diligence spend because the deal structure itself is very de-risked? Both. So again, it really depends on depends on the deal, depends on the seller, depends on you know what we've got going on. So yeah, so you know we've got sort of in-house legal counsel and a you know fellow by the name of Martin, and so we actually closed a deal about a, a month or so ago, and we bought a film production company here in the UK, and yeah, so I, I just you know I pieced Martin into the deal, and so just he just got a you know, just gave him some equity for doing some of the work, and so that that approach of being collaborative, I think, is is a great way to to do things. You know, we're take sort of a, a community to raise a child, right? And I think if you can align yourself with like-minded people that, you know, can all kind of pull an oar in the boat and, you know, to share in in the ownership, I think that's a great way to do it. And not just sharing in the ownership with your own, call it a, a deal team, but I think also, you know, sharing in the upside with a seller is also a great thing to do. And so I think our view of deal making, again, is it's much less of, you know, here's the deal, take it or leave it. I think it's it's kind of sitting down with a seller and, and whoever you're pulling into this thing, like how do we make all the, how do we make the economics work for everybody and how do we all benefit and how do we all kind of share in some of that risk? And so, yeah, it, it really depends on what the, the drivers are, but I mean, that's kind of how we view things. I mean, business wins, it's not binary where someone wins and someone fails. We truly believe that everybody has to win from these deals or it just doesn't make sense. And it's really hard to get those deals over the line. That's a really great perspective and the collaborative, flexible win, win, win approach seems to be a really strong position. I'm curious for somebody who wants to start to implement this in their business or their lives, what would be the first action step or a homework item that they could begin implementing immediately after listening to this conversation that you would recommend? Yeah, you know, I I think first and foremost, look, you've got to be passionate about what you're doing. I think it's it's important. I, I think there's, you know, I've been at this for a long time and I love sort of the deal making process. And for me, it's a ton of fun. And this is what I, I think I was just built to be able to do. And so you meet a lot of people that they got the shiny new object syndrome and, you know, one minute they're buying and selling properties and the next minute they're trading cryptocurrency and the next minute they're wanting to, you know, buy a business, but they never stick with anything long enough. I think you've really got to, you've got to identify what's important to you and what do you want to do? And then, you know, I think once you establish that, you've got to put in the time. If you put in the time, you're going to get good. And if you get good, the reward should follow. But I think you've got to decide that you sort of want to go down a path like this. And then, you know, you've got to sort of learn, I guess, some of the different ways and frameworks of being able to do a deal. And then, you know, I think the best way to do a deal is just to jump in the pool and get started. And I think it's um, start having meaningful conversations with people. And that's a paradigm shift because I think a lot of people have this idea that business building is all about let's chase the next client and let's chase the next invoice. And that puts people on a hamster wheel of that slow and it's the hard slog to kind of grow that way. You're always sort of chasing the next buck. But I think if you change the way that you're sort of having conversations with people, and if you if you look at it from a, a business ownership standpoint, and if you look at it from a, a deal-making perspective, I try to broaden the depth of conversations that we're having. So it's not just about you know, becoming a client necessarily. It's about how can we work together to, you know, to become, to collaborate, to make something better. And so, you know, whether it's a merger, whether it's an acquisition, I mean, how will this make the both of us better? And I think if you have those sort of higher level conversations with people, you're going to be surprised at actually what comes back and where the flex points are and and what sort of people are looking for. And, you know, one thing that I I kind of talk a little bit about in terms of doing a deal as well is, you know, everybody thinks they got to go in and they got to buy sort of 100% of a company right off the bat. And everybody listening to this has a skill set. Everybody has something that they can bring to the table. So whether you're a sales guy, a marketer, or whatever you're great at, use that as your bartering tool. Use that as your currency to get yourself into a deal. 
if you're a great salesperson, you go to a company and, and there's a lot of them out there that just, they're not good at, at generating sales or they need more sales. Or if you position yourself as, look, I've been doing sales for years. And so how do I, you know, how do I help you with your business? And instead of sort of fee for service, get your foot in the door by taking equity. So get some ownership in the business, perhaps it's a minority stake or whatever you can negotiate, get your foot in the door, bringing your value to the table. It does a couple things. So one, you've now, you've traded off your time for ownership in the business. Number one, so you have a stake. Number two, you're going to start to build some rapport with these people because now you're working together. And so the third thing is when it comes time for them to sell the rest of the business down the road, you've already have the rapport built. They can see how you work. Hopefully it's been a good experience. And so who would be the logical person to buy that out? Well, it would be you because you know, you've been into the business now for you know, a year or two years. And so from a financing standpoint, on sort of the scale of easiest to, to difficult, that's an easy narrative to finance is sort of, you know, somebody already has a minority stake and they just want to buy out the remaining shares of the, of the seller. That's probably something that financiers can really wrap their head around. So that's, you know, that's another way in terms of somebody getting started that might want to look at doing deals is, you know, use your skill set in life as your currency into a deal, get yourself a, you know, instead of trading time for dollars, trade time for getting a stake and then sort of go from there, build some rapport and figure out how to sort of you know, buy out the remaining shares down the road. And Perry, where can listeners find more about you and your workshops and all of your work online? I've got a website called perryanderson.global, perryanderson with an O-S-O-N dot global. And uh, yeah, you can mostly find me there. If you want to peruse our firm, it's called Quadra Capital. It's where you can find me. Well, Perry, this has been a fascinating conversation, some really great insights into the behind the scenes of the private equity world, how to finance transactions in a non-traditional and very interesting way. So I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all this wisdom with our listeners. Hey, Matt, it's been my pleasure. It's been a great past hour. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or if you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. Mm-hmm.